We're talking Giants GM. What are the questions that need to be answered? What are the challenges? And who do I like for the position? That's coming up on today's Locked On Giants podcast. You are Locked On Giants, your daily New York Giants podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, New York Giant fans, and welcome to another edition of the Locked On Giants podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast family, your team every day. My name is Patricia Traina. Happy Monday to everybody. That's right. We're coming to you uh, right smack in the middle of the wild card playoff rounds, but already some good news. If you're a Giant fan, the Dallas Cowboys and Philadelphia Eagles eliminated from the playoffs. So look, misery enjoys company and if that makes me a bad person for being happy that both those teams are out, then so be it. But anyway, uh, on today's show, we are going to talk Giants general manager. Uh, the Giants, as of this recording, and I'm recording this on Sunday night, the Giants have, have interviewed seven of their nine reported candidates. They will wrap up interviews on Monday, and then they will whittle down the list. And I believe the goal is to get somebody in place if not by the end of this week, by early next week, because they do need to get a jump start on the head coaching process, which the new GM is going to lead. So on today's show, we're going to talk about some of the questions that maybe the GM was asked. Uh, that inspired, by the way, by a, a, a question that I received from a, re, a uh, listener, excuse me, who wanted to know what GM's um, what goes on during a GM interview. So uh, I'm going to try and play, fill in some of the, the gaps there and, you know, how I think the Giants would like those questions to be answered. Then we are going to talk a little bit about the challenges that as they exist with the current state of the Giants franchise for whoever does get the job. And then we'll close it out with the guys that I think might be in the lead, might have the strongest consideration and why they might be um, strongly considered for the position. So that is the lineup on today's show. Thank you again for making us your first listen of the day or your first watch of the day if you're catching us on YouTube. And uh, let's go ahead and kick it off. All right, so as I mentioned, I received a letter, an email actually, from somebody wanting to know what goes on during a general manager's interview. What, how does, How are they structured? What kind of questions are they asked and so on and so forth. And there are any number of questions I think that, that come up um, from just getting to know somebody to talking football philosophies and whatnot. But if I were conducting the Giants GM search, he, I have a list. I have put together a list of questions that I would ask and I'm going to tell you what they are. I'm going to tell you why I would ask them. So here goes. Um, one of the first questions, obviously, um, that, and these are in no particular order, by the way, one of the first questions, what do, do you look for in a head coach? Do you have a, a specific philosophy? Now, there are some GMs who are wide open and just will say the best available. There are some who have philosophies that it should be an offensive minded head coach. There are some who believe it should be a defensive minded head coach. There are some who are not afraid to take a risk and go to the college ranks. There are some who believe that they should stick with experience. So you get all different shapes and sizes and, and flavors, if you will. So if I'm the Giants, what would I want to hear if I asked that question? Well, obviously you want the best person available. That goes without saying, but considering all the problems that the team has had on the offensive side of the ball, and not just this past year, but for the last few years, I think I would be, uh, I, I would give extra credit, if you will, to someone who said, we've got to look at offensive minded coaches, especially for this team, because we don't know what we have in Daniel Jones. We don't know if Saquon and the running game is going to be, you know, any good because of the offensive line and the lack of creativity before. So, you know, I would think that that would be 
one of the answers that maybe the Giants management would want to hear. Now, again, you don't want to necessarily limit yourself to just offensive side of the ball because defense is important too. But I just, I just think based on where the Giants ended the season last year, they're a little further ahead on the defensive side of the ball than they are on the offensive side of the ball. And I think the offensive side actually needs more fixing than the defensive side. So that would be obviously one area and one possible response I'd be looking at. All right, another big question, scouting philosophies. Um, in the past, the Giants have not been afraid to take gambles on athletes as opposed to football players. And there, yes, folks, there is a difference between an athlete and a football player. But more specifically, I think if I'm ownership, I'd want to know from the GM candidates, you know, what do they look for? Do they pigeonhole, for example, defensive ends into a set criteria? Do they look for specific traits in all the players? And what's the common thread in all the players that they look for um, that they have added to the, their respective teams over the, their careers? So for me, I would want, obviously, football players over athletes. Um, I would also probably want to see them not necessarily pigeonholing guys into size. In other words, if you've got a guy, let's say a defensive end who's 6'1 and maybe 260 as opposed to being 6'3 and 270 plus, um, I don't necessarily want to hear if the guy is discounted because he doesn't meet a certain height or weight um, range. Um, I know that there is, are charts that suggest ideal um, heights and weights and hand length and arm width and all that stuff for different positions. But I think when you're scouting, what I would want to hear a prospective general manager say, I would want to hear them talk about production being the number one thing and not just, you know, the production at the college level, because I, I get it. All production is not equal. You have, you know, smaller school production you know, did, did a, a prospect, for example, look like a man amongst boys? Um, you have the larger school production, you know, like the Alabamas and the Georgias, where those are as close to pro-ready as you're going to find. So, obviously, you have to grade all that on a curb, but I think, you know, that would be something I would want to hear from a GM candidate is um, what philosophies go into their selection of players at why. Okay, the next thing on my list that I would want to hear about is how they plan to manage the salary cap. Now, some GMs will be hands-on with that. Some will be hands-off. They will hire a cap specialist. So I would want to know, regardless of how they're going to handle the actual day-to-day -day management, what's their philosophy regarding, are they, for example, into extending contracts mid-year? Are they more inclined to wait? Do they believe in restructuring? Do they uh, use certain types of vehicles to keep cap numbers reasonable? You know, such as voidable years and stuff like that. Um, what's their track record? Do they use a lot of bonuses? You know, how do they go about building player contracts? There are many different ways you could build a contract um, that go beyond the vanilla way of base salary or P5 salary, signing bonus, workout bonus, and some incentives. There are creative things that teams have done. So I would want to know if the candidates have an idea as to how they're going to handle the salary cap. Because right now, as I've told you guys and gals before, the giant salary cap is a mess this year. It can get better. They can fix it in a year with some smart moves. But right now, it's going to hurt. And um, they're going to have to obviously make some decisions and moves to fix that all up. So that's something I think is very important to also ask a prospective GM candidate. Scouting department. This is a big one. And this is important because here we are, we're, um, we're approaching the second half of January and the college all-star games are going to start very soon. So you're not going to overturn the scouting department right at this moment, all right, because they're too far into their season, if you will, with the work done. But what I would want to know is moving forward, what are your plans for the scouting department? Are you going to redivide, you know, reassign the different areas of the country? Are you going to um, hire new scouts? 
you know, get rid of old scouts? Are you going to change how reports are written? Um, there had been a report I, I, in, a, I forget which media uh, outlet had it, but there was a report that Dave Gettleman actually um, had their, the scouts. I think it was, I think it was Ty Dunn's article. I think they, uh, Ty Dunn reported that Dave Gettleman, when he was the general manager, had the scouts do their reports a little differently. Um, typically, the typical scouting report is you, you cover five core traits that every player has to have, and then there are specific uh, traits, uh, position-specific traits that you that you look for. So I don't have the article in front of me. I don't remember um, what the change was, but uh, Ty Dunn had that in his Go Long series, uh, he in, in the uh, three-part series that he did, which was pretty, you know, detailed. So I would recommend checking that out if you can. But that's important because, you know, how are the reports being done? How is the data being considered? You know, if you've got, if you're evaluating five offensive centers, for example, what's going to distinguish the five from amongst each other? Is it going to be a pure numerical grade? And how do you come up with that numerical grade? So these are all little intricacies that I think are important to get to know from a general manager because he is going to be the one who's going to oversee all this stuff, all right, in co cooperation possibly with a director of college scouting and maybe a director of pro personnel. So, and speaking of pro personnel, you know, when I talk about college scouting, um, you can also talk about pro scouting too. You know, how are they going to manage super, you know, keeping an eye on the entire league so that when guys hit the waiver wire, they know instantly, okay, yes, this is somebody we want to put a waiver claim on. So that's a very, very key, important um, element. And then um, one other thing that pops to mind, this is probably at the bottom of the totem pole, but it still bears mentioning, media relations. Now, whether they like it or not, league uh, media policies do require the GM to speak to the media at least a couple times a year. Usually they speak to us before training camp, um, definitely during the draft, uh, before the draft and during the draft. And uh, sometimes I think they talk to us, well, although they haven't really done it the last couple of years, but some teams will have their GMs speak to the media at the bye week. So do you have somebody who, you know, is going to be... Um, a Gettleman type. Gettleman was very personable, you know, joked around, had a lot of throwaway lines and maybe, you know, some lines that he put out there that he probably shouldn't have. Or do you have somebody who's going to be straight laced and buttoned down like Jerry Reese was? So that kind of style is important. And not just with the media, the communication style is also important with the entire staff. You know, do you have somebody who's a kibitzer or somebody who likes to kid around? Do you have somebody who's straight laced? You know, so that's very important, too, because that has to mirror what the expectations are of the organization. And right now, the Giants are in a state that they really can't afford to have somebody who, who's not buttoned down and ready to roll up the sleeves and get right to work. So those are some of the qualities that um, I think gen the uh, Giants ownership team of Steve Tisch, John Mara, and Chris Mara might have touched upon with some of the GM candidates. Now, I'm sure there are other questions. Um, could be things about background, could be, you know, traditional type of job questions like what drew you into scouting or, you know, why did you want to be uh, the GM of this team or, you know, silly questions like that. I doubt they would waste time with that, but you never know. You know, the bottom line is unless you're sitting in those interviews with these candidates, you would not know, obviously, what they would be asked. So, um, so yeah, so coming up, we will talk about um, the challenges that the next GM, the next Giants GM has to face. And then still to come, we will talk about which candidates I like and why. So stick around. All right, Giant fans, still more to come on today's show. But first, if you're aiming to get fit or eat healthier, make sure you include Built Bar in your plan. Built Bar is the protein bar that tastes like a candy bar and not like one of those waxy or chalky or chemically concoctions uh, that most protein bars uh, taste like. 
you'll want to eat Bilt Bar whenever you're feeling hungry because uh, most Bilt Bars have about 130 calories, four grams of sugar, four net carbs, and 17 grams of protein, making them the perfect snack in between meals. Bilt Bar makes it easy to stick to your New Year's resolution to eat right without the guilt and without the calories. So head on over to BiltBar.com today and use our special promo code LOCKED15 to save 15% off your first order. Again, that's code LOCKED15, L-O-C-K-E-D, one five for fifteen percent off at builtbar.com. All right, Giant fans, welcome back to the Locked On Giants podcast. Patricia Trainer here with you, and just a quick reminder: uh, we will do another mailbag this week. If I have enough questions, I will do it for Tuesday. If not, I will do it on Thursday. But now, with the Giant season obviously over. The schedule is wide open, so I'm not locked in necessarily to doing specific shows on specific days. So um, I may even start incorporating some of your questions on a daily basis, depending on how many come in. So this way we don't let them back up. But still, the plan for this week is either Twitter Tuesday or Twitter Thursday. So get those questions in. And if we have a lot of questions, then heck, maybe we'll do we'll do uh, two mailbags, you know, so uh, get those questions in. And also, if there's a specific topic that you would like me to talk about here on the Lothan Giants podcast, always happy to consider that as well and see if I can make that happen. You can uh, drop those comments in on YouTube underneath the show title here. Or if you're listening to us on our audio platform, just send them to me at LockdownGiantsPodcast at gmail.com. And I'll see what I can make happen for you guys and gals. And that includes uh, also any live shows that you might be interested in. Because the live show last week with the entertainer really went over well. So, all right, let's get to uh, get back to our general manager topic here. So on the fir- in the first segment, I spoke about questions I think ownership would probably ask of the GM candidates. Let's talk now about the challenges specific to the New York Giants organization the next GM candidate is going to have. Now, right off the bat, I mentioned the salary cap. The Giants, as of uh, this recording, and as a, as per over the cap, are going to be over $9 million in the red in functional cap space, which means once top 51 kicks in, which it does so at the start of the new league year, the Giants are going to have to cut guys and redo contracts in order to get into compliance with the cap. So that all factors into the challenges and the questions that I mentioned before about asking the the GM candidates how they're going to handle this stuff. Now at this particular juncture, it probably isn't fair to ask a new GM Um, or a GM candidate, I should say, who he would cut and who he would not cut. And the reason for that, obviously, is you don't have the head coach in place yet. And um, you probably want to sit and do a detailed look at the film before you make any decisions. Now, that's not to say that these these guys aren't familiar from their work at with uh, pro personnel and, you know, the work that they've done with their current teams. But you probably want to have, in addition to the film, you want to have, have access to any other data that might be exclusive to the Giants. So that's something they're going to have to really, you know, roll up their sleeves and put the elbow grease in to get caught up on that. And ideally, you'd like to see the GM do that with the head coach, whoever, you know, that might be. So in terms of the cap, um, it might be premature to you know to say how they would handle it but but certainly they're going to have to figure out how to fix it so that the top five guys under the 2022 cap don't account for roughly 50 percent of the cap that is a huge huge problem again it's fixable but you know here's the thing with the salary cap folks the cap is not just a one-year affair you have to kind of project it out to two three four years down the line and it's like a puzzle So it's like, okay, you know, maybe I can't fit, you know, an extension for player X in here, you know, under 2022, but I can fit them in for 2023. So these are all things you have to consider when you're a general manager candidate. And this is certainly going to be one of the challenges that the new GM is going to have to face. For example, um, if Daniel Jones 
they if they decline Daniel Jones's fifth year option, which I think they will, but then Daniel Jones comes in, he stays healthy, they get a hot shot offensive coordinator, and that and Daniel Jones has a huge, huge year. Do you say, okay, you know what? We're not gonna wait until next year. We're gonna get your contract done now. All right, so that's something that has to be taken into consideration. So there's a lot of little things regarding the cap that a GM has to decide on. And the most important thing is, is just managing it so that two, three, four years down the line, you're not scrambling to um, figure out, now what do I do because I don't have enough to get me through the season or I'm too top heavy or whatever the case may be. So that's definitely challenge number one. Challenge number 1A is going to be head coach. Actually, you could say it's, it's probably on par with the salary cap. Head coach is very important. And um, as I mentioned before, some GMs have different philosophies as to how they do things. Some like offensive-minded coaches, some like defensive, some don't care. They just look for the best possible candidate. So if you're the new Giants GM, do you say to yourself, okay, our offense has been pretty bad the last few years, so I'm going to get a hotshot offensive-minded coach in here? Or do you say, you know what, I want to maintain the defense, so I'm going to bring in, you know, a defensive-minded coach and then let that guy hire a hotshot offensive coordinator. So these are some of the things they have to consider. Along those lines, you know, what questions are you going to ask of head coaching candidates? And that would include, you know, who your coordinators, who you're thinking for your coordinators, how are you thinking of setting up the program as far as practices, practice structures, meetings, um, contingency plans, you know, with COVID obviously st looking like it's here to stay, how are they going to function in that regard, um, injury situation, and just basically communication, you know, is, is, is a head coach going to come in here and insist that he have the type of players he wants as opposed to reaching a, a consensus with the GM. So that's a big thing. Um, and, uh, you know, personality along with goes along with that. And, you know, that goes back to what I was saying about communication and how a GM potentially deals not just with the media, but with the people within the building. All right. And then um, the other challenge, like I said, scouting department. What the Giants have been doing, obviously, has not worked. All right. You need not look any further than the fact that a lot of their players do not get second contracts, the draft class I'm talking about. You need not look uh, any further than the fact that they don't have a lot of pro bowlers or all pro players. Um, they hit a dry spot like none other at, in the third round. So something's not being done correctly. What that something is, I can only guess, as I'm sure you can, but that has to change. So if you're the new GM and you have this all-important draft that's coming up, where you have five of your nine picks in the top 100, do you make radical changes now? Or do you wait until after the draft is done when, when it makes, in most cases, it makes sense? Um, that's something they have to figure out. I would say, you know, you would probably see some changes made, especially as scouts go to pro days and they prepare to go to the college all-star games, which is why it's important that the Giants get this wrapped up as quickly as possible before all this stuff starts. But then you have to, you know, you're talking about potentially retraining scouts to do things differently. So what is going to be the plan of attack? And that's something that the new GM is going to have to figure out when he gets into the building. So, all right, um, those are the, the three main challenges, obviously, for a new GM who's good, who, you know, on day one, that person's going to have to hit the ground running. And um, Rome wasn't built in a day, but they better at least have a foundation in place by the time, uh, you know, that draft rolls around because this is a big, big draft. And uh, getting the right people into the building is going to be huge, not just players, but coaches, consultants. And oh, there's one other thing I have to mention because this is. I know this bothers some people, and I, 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 I don't mean to gloss over it, and I am going to do a show on it down the line, but injuries, all right? Now, I know a lot of people out there think 
that it's on Ronnie Barnes uh, because Ronnie Barnes has been here for the longest time, that he's responsible and, and for the, all these injuries that happen. Folks, for what it's worth, Ronnie Barnes and, and the team of doctors are there to treat injuries. They're not necessarily training the players. All right. When you talk about the training aspect of it, that's the strength and conditioning coach, which falls under the jurisdiction of the head coach. All right. So when Aaron Wellman was here and Pratik Patel was here, I don't think the Giants had half the injury issues that they've had since. Um, you go back to the Parcells years, I, you know, when Johnny Parker was their longtime strength and conditioning coach, they didn't have half the problems. So that could be part of it. The other part of it with injuries, for what it's worth, could be that these players, when they hire their own personal trainers, they're hiring trainers that are more generic in nature as opposed to football trainers. So that obviously has to be a special project that the new GM assigns to somebody to look into because the Giants now, um, I want to say two or three years in a row, maybe even longer, have been at or near the top of injuries. And that's something that cannot continue because that just totally wrecks the franchise and the direction you set. So, all right, folks, coming up next, who are the candidates I like? Why and who do I think it's going to be as of Sunday night when I'm recording this? I'm going to tell you when I come back. All right, Giant fans, we have more coming up on today's show. But first, Bet Online would like to wish you a happy new betting year. As the NFL postseason is underway, the NBA and the NHL continue to heat up, and the sports world continues to bring so many memorable moments, not just today, but in the weeks ahead. Bet Online remains your number one spot for all the best sports wagerings action for 2022. It's a new year, and BetOnline.ag has a new an updated website you can access it on your desktop or on your mobile uh, device and when you sign up today using our promo code locked on you can get a 50 percent welcome bonus on your initial deposit don't wait to take advantage of all the amazing offers available for 2022 visit betonline.ag which is the fastest and easiest way to wager on all your favorite sports bet online where the game starts All right, Giant fans, you got Patricia Trainer here on the Locked on Giants podcast. We're talking Giants GM. And I've spoken about some of the questions that the candidates likely had to answer. I've spoken about some of the challenges that are awaiting whoever does get the job. Now I'm going to talk about who I think might be in the final round of interviews and which of the finalists I like and why. So... Nine candidates, and as again, as of Monday, when you are watching this show, the Giants still have to interview the 49er candidates, Adam Peters and Rand Carthen. Um, in terms of the finalists, I think the Giants will narrow it down to maybe four finalists tops, probably closer to three, I would think. I, I can't imagine it'll be more than three four at, 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 at the most, but I would say between three and four. So the ones that I have, I actually have three that I like, and um, I'll tell you why I like them. And I'll just take a guess as to who it's going to be. Now, you know, obviously, I'm not sitting in the interviews. Um, so I don't know how the Mara family and the Tish family feel about these candidates, but we'll find out, obviously. All right, so who do I like? I like Joe Hortiz uh, from the Baltimore Ravens, Joe Shane from the Buffalo Bills, and Ryan Poles from the Kansas City Chiefs. All right, so let's take each one, and I will tell you why I like that person, and then I will come to a conclusion. Hortiz from the Baltimore Ravens. The Ravens franchise is one that is set up that you go and you look at their history, going back to when Ozzie Newsom was the GM, just it just seems like year after year they just have solid rosters so whatever they're doing their scouting process um, their pro personnel process their uh, you know management of the cap 
When you talk about gold standards, the Ravens are right up there. It's been consistent, and that is something that the Giants have lacked, as we all know. They haven't had that consistency. And, you know, all three of these candidates, by the way, have experience in both the pro personnel side and the college personnel side, which is important. You want to have a guy who has experience in both. But um, I just feel like Cortez, you know, having learned under Ozzie Newsom, who was just so good at managing every aspect of the job, from the salary cap right down to the draft, right down to roster building, to projections, all that stuff. I don't know that you can go wrong if you go with Joe Ortiz. Um, if he brings some of that Baltimore magic up north to East Rutherford, I think we could all be happy if, if uh, the Giants decide on him. All right, Joe Shane, Buffalo Bills. Um, this is kind of interesting. I, I, I thought about this because uh, Brandon Bean, as everybody knows, is the GM of the Buffalo Bills. And Brandon Bean worked with Dave Gettleman down in Carolina when uh, Gettleman was the GM. But Brandon Bean, when he went to Buffalo, kind of became his own man. And you look at how he turned that Bills team around from being, you know, an afterthought, really, a, a, a laughingstock, a joke, into a solid contender. And Bean deserves a lot of credit for that. And Joe Shane, who has come along for the ride, he worked with uh, Bean down in Carolina and he joined him again in Buffalo. Um, he's been part of that ride. So, again, you think of what he's been able to learn at the hand of Brandon Bean, and you see how he's turned things around with, with not just draft picks, but with play, you know, trades and, and free agency and when to let guys go. And the Buffalo Bills, they've done a pretty good job. I mean, I don't know if you saw the playoff game uh, this past weekend. Buffalo Bills are here to stay, folks. They are here to stay. They have finally, I think, supplanted the New England Patriots as the team to beat in the NFC, the, uh, excuse me, the AFC East. So kudos to that management team. And Joe Shane, very intriguing. And, you know, I know a lot of people think, okay, the Giants hire Joe Shane, then they'll bring uh, Brian Dayball with him, the offensive coordinator. I don't know if that's necessarily a slam dunk. Because, you know, other teams have gotten a, a jump start on interviewing for a head coaching candidate spot. But the good news is, I think, so long as the Bills are in the playoffs, if the Giants can get, you know, started on their head head coaching search as of next week, um, they, they still might have a chance. So, all right. And then finally, Ryan Poles, who's with Kansas City. You look at Kansas City, and again, the thing that stands out amongst others, besides the play of Patrick Mahomes, is how they turn their offensive line around so quickly um, in one year, basically, which, as everybody knows, is a big problem for the Giants. Now, the Chiefs did have some problems on defense this year, but um, still, that management team has a pretty solid track record. Uh, building rosters and making decisions and making smart moves. And they're not afraid to take gambles. And there have been gambles that have paid off. So that said, of these three candidates, who do I like and why? Now, before I give you my answer, the tricky thing here is that we don't know who drafted who. In other words, you look at Baltimore, for example, which players did Joe uh, did uh, Joe Hortiz pound the table for? What grades did he give to players? Was he overruled by anybody higher than him? We don't know all that information. That applies to the other candidates as well. But that being said, the candidate that I would pick out of those three would be Hortiz. Because again, you look at the Ravens and how they have functioned and how they have operated and you can't really say that they've made a lot of missteps over the years as far as personnel. I mean, you don't have any blunders where you say, oh my God, what are they thinking? So on the limited information I have, and there will be more that comes out, obviously, as we find out who the, the uh, candidates are that are, you know, the finalists, there will be more that comes out. But based on the information I have, Hortiz would be my pick.
Doesn't mean that the other eight guys aren't qualified, but I really like what the Ravens have done and how they have been consistent year after year after year with pretty much the same management team. But at this point, you know that how they do things is so deeply rooted in each guy that you have hope that if you plan to seed from that organization in the Giants organization, that maybe that will blossom into something special here. All right, so agree, disagree, let me know who you think should be the next Giants GM. Drop a comment below if you're watching on YouTube or if you're listening on our audio platforms, drop me an email and tell me who you like and why. And uh, I'll circle back a little later in the week and we'll we'll talk about it. So that'll do it for me here on today's Locked on Giants podcast. As always, appreciate you making us your first listen of the day or your first watch of the day if on YouTube. And if on YouTube, if you haven't already done so, please subscribe and hit that little bell button and like the channel more subscribers we have, the merrier. And as you know, I'm working towards 2,000 subscribers. Don't know what the 2,000 mark is going to bring. The 1,000 mark was the lollipop. We'll see what the 2,000 mark is. It would be nice if it would be a diamond, but I think I'd have to wait a while for that. But anyway, um, we'll, tr we'll try to do a mailbag tomorrow, depending on how many uh, questions we have. If not tomorrow, it'll be Thursday. Otherwise, just tune in tomorrow, and we'll get you caught up on all things Giants. Have a great one, everybody.